Hi guys. Good morning to one and all. Uh, please note, guys, we'll wait for 10 minutes more. We'll start the webinar by 10 10 as we are expecting more participants to join the webinar. So we'll start the webinar by 10 10. Thank you.
Hello guys, those who have connected just now, please note we will start the webinar by 1010 .10, as we are expecting more participants to join. So we'll start the webinar sharp at 1010. .10. Till the time you can just follow our social media platforms. I have shared the link in the chat box. So if you want to uh, go and follow us uh, on our social media platforms, you can go and uh, like click on that links and follow us on the social media platforms to get the updates about the webinars and workshop which we do. Thank you. OK, so I think we should start with the webinar now. Good morning, guys. Good morning to one and all. Uh, welcome you all in this advanced role based training on AZ 400. So myself, Shaitali, your host for this webinar. So talking about our webinar sponsor, Synergetics. So Synergetics is India's one of a kind corporate learning solution company, as you all know. We have different kind of solutions on which we give trainings. You can see uh, here the solutions like onboarding solution we have. Then we have the skilling solution. Then we have certification solution. So AZ 400 certification training comes under certification solution. Then we have a certification plus add on solution. Then we have cloud adoption solution. Architecting solution, practice playbook solution, 
latest technology training solution and emerging technology training solution. So we do provide trainings on the solutions. Then today's webinar is organized by ATC community. That is Azure Tech community and sponsored by Synergetics and Microsoft. So our ATC community is open to all the people who are interested in cloud technologies. So under this ATC community, we have different communities as well. As you can see, we have emerging technology community. For all, then we have Azure Tech community Pune for Pune Kers. Then we have emerging technology community Surat. Azure Tech community Nagpur for Nagpur Kers. You just need to install the meetup app on your phone and follow these communities so you'll get the relevant updates on the webinars workshop training which we do then code of conduct which you all need to follow guys please note no one is allowed to take the screenshot of the presentation and cannot do the screen recording uh, we'll share this recording on our youtube channel official youtube channel for that you have to make sure you subscribe to a youtube channel I have already shared the YouTube channel link in the chat box. So make sure you go and subscribe to the YouTube channel. So you'll get the recording over there. Then today's speaker for this session is Mr. Mahendra Shinde. He is an MCT and currently work as DevOps practice head in Synergetics. <clears throat> then agenda for this session. Uh, so uh, participants will get an overview of AZ400 certification and will explain one of the module in depth. Uh, OK, so in this webinar, we are providing complimentary AZ400 learning achievement badge. So once you redeem this badge, you will get a, a badge on your profile, learn profile, which you can showcase it on uh, your LinkedIn profile or on your Twitter profile. For that, you have to follow certain steps as it has been shown on the screen. You can see I will share this uh, steps with you all and the link for to redeem the badge with for AZ 400 in chat box. So make sure you follow the steps and get your badge activated. Then there is a uh, open AI month going on in which we have open webinars on AI technology. So if anyone of you is interested in AI technology can attend this webinar. I will share the registration link and schedule for the same in the chat box. So you all can go and register yourself for any of the topic related to the AI. Then make sure you follow our social media platforms like LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. I have already shared the links with you all. So you just have to, you know, follow our social media platforms to get the relevant updates on the uh, whatever the training certifications which we do. Also, it's a request to all the participants who make sure you share the feedback form by the end of the uh, webinar. We will share the feedback form link in the chat box. So you just have to submit that feedback form by the end of the session. That's all from my side. Now I will like to hand over the mic to Mahindra sir so he can go ahead with the webinar. Thank you guys. Hello. Hello, am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, yeah. We can hear you. OK, OK. Thank you. So hi, guys. Uh, my name is Mahindra Shinde. And uh, as Chaitali has explained, uh, I have I've done MCT, Microsoft Certified Trainer. And I do conduct uh, various different training sessions for uh, multiple Azure certifications like uh, AZ400, AZ305, AZ104 and so on. So today uh, we will discuss AZ400, which is Azure DevOps Certification Training Program, 
Uh, but before we discuss AZ400, I will just give you a quick uh, look into Microsoft certification paths which are available in here. I'll be sharing my screen. Let me know once my screen is visible to all of you. Is my screen visible to everyone right, right now? Yes, sir, yes. Yeah. OK, fine. So as you guys can see, Microsoft has multiple different uh, certification path for different type of job role. Like there is a certification for administrators. There is certification for data analyst. There is certification for, let's say, developers. And there is a certification for DevOps engineers. This URL, if you visit this URL, it will give you more information about all the various different certification paths. The one we are discussing today in this session is DevOps engineer certification. There's only one exam required for Azure DevOps engineer. And that one is AZ400 Azure DevOps uh, solution implementing Azure DevOps solution. There is also another optional certification that you can do along with this, which is for Power Platform. Which is PL100. This one is optional. Similarly, I will just give you a quick uh, look into another uh, certification path. Like if you go with Azure Administrator certification, uh, then there are uh, different, different, you can say path available. Like there is one for virtual desktop, there is one for Azure Stack, and AZ104, which is uh, the Azure Administration exam. So you will get more information about various different certification path from here. Now talking about Azure DevOps AZ400, just give me a minute. AZ400 is a 400 is a DevOps certification, and uh, this will focus more on Azure DevOps and DevOps as a generic concept. Both. One good thing about the certification is. Uh, recently, Microsoft has included one more DevOps platform in this particular certification program, which is GitHub. Wait a second, I'll be sharing a presentation screen. I hope my screen is visible. I have I'm now playing a presentation, a PowerPoint presentation. I hope it's visible to all of you. So. Every certification training program that you attend like this one is a 400. Uh, the certification training programs are delivered by Microsoft certified trainers and instructors, and uh, they offer. They offer their knowledge, technical expertise and their experience to make the training session more fruitful and uh, to get more knowledge about the said topic. Certification exam, Microsoft certifications, if you are planning for Microsoft certification, not just Azure DevOps, uh, but for that matter, any certification program from Microsoft, please remember Microsoft certification will actually help you uh, to distinguish yourself from rest of the people, rest of the expert on the given topic. Certification will give you a kind of acknowledgement that this person here has a proper knowledge on this particular platform and technology. That's me, Mahindra Shinde. So before we start with this uh, session today, I just want all of you to use the chat window and provide some information about yourself here. Like uh, I expect you to put your name, the organization where you are working for, and title or job role. And if you have any Azure certificate, Azure experience, then you can specify that here. Can we do that now? Hello. Can you all quickly introduce yourself in a OK? So Saurabh Joshi has already started. Thanks. OK, we'll just wait for two minutes for everyone to put their uh, introduction here.
OK, so few people have put their introduction in here. Thank you very much, everyone. So here we have got people who have worked with full stack development, and there are people who have worked with administration or network, etc. OK, great. So we have developers, we have operations, multiple different fields. OK, great. Great, so let's continue now. So what basically is a DevOps? Please remember the certification program here talks about DevOps, but you'll have to understand one thing. What exactly is this new role? DevOps as a new role. What exactly DevOps professionals do and what kind of skill were expected from DevOps professional? So DevOps professionals basically supposed to be from multiple different background. Not every DevOps professional is a developer and not every DevOps professional is from system administration or operations background. No, DevOps professional basically are people who are from multiple different technologies or multiple different fields. You might have people from development experience, development background. The, the, you might have people who are from operations, right? Into a DevOps field. DevOps basically combine people, process and technologies with a common objective. And any guess what is common objective of DevOps? Or what is a common objective for all the teams involved? The common objective is to deliver the quality product to the client in given time. OK, in scheduled time. So timely delivery and quality of the product, both you have to ensure. I'm just using a very simple generic terms here to explain it. DevOps professionals will try to streamline the delivery by optimizing some of the practices, some of the tools, improve the day to day collaboration and communication between different team members and making use of automation as and when required or as and when possible. So you will notice one thing, some aspect of DevOps some aspect of DevOps, some of the processes of DevOps are, you can say, more aligned with development activities. And some of the practices of DevOps are more aligned with operations and system administration. Let's say automating the environment setup. It is more towards operations or system administration, for example, whereas version control, dependency management, or code reviews, this is all more on developer side. So DevOps include multiple different practices and role. When you say you are a DevOps professional, you could be a developer with DevOps experience or you could be a system administrator with DevOps experience. Azure DevOps, on the other hand, is a platform Microsoft has developed and it provides end-to-end -end capabilities all for DevOps. Here you have tools and practices for developers, tools and some practices, some processes for testers and some tools and integration with some external tools for system administration and operations team. Now when I say end to end, Azure DevOps itself has multiple different components which are independent of others. You may or may not use all Azure DevOps component in your project. Rather, you can replace one of the component with some other tool if you want. Like for example, you can use Azure Pipeline to build the project, but instead of using Azure board for Agile project planning, you might use a different Agile project planning or different uh, project planning tool. Okay, that's possible. So, as an Azure DevOps professional, you must be able to design and implement DevOps practices for multiple different things like version control, for compliance, for infrastructure, for configuration management, for building, releasing, and testing your applications using various different components Azure offers or Microsoft offers to us. So that's about the DevOps role. Now, 
one interesting aspect of this particular uh, AZ400 certification program is it actually covers a lot many different aspects of DevOps. You will notice this is actual course outline. This entire training program is actually for five days and you will notice there are total nine modules in here. Now we don't call them modules. We now call them learning path. Each one of these learning path might have three, four, or six, seven, eight, nine different sub modules. So these nine modules, let's see all of them in a little, uh, a very brief. Okay. The first learning path is about DevOps transformation journey. We will, I will explain you this particular learning path here in today's session. This is more about like how do organizations who are not using DevOps earlier. How about those organizations which were using legacy practices, older practices for building and delivering their product to customer? How can they adapt DevOps? Now, this learning path is more about DevOps as a generic concept, and it is not actually about Azure DevOps. Yes, we will be discussing little part, little bit of Azure DevOps platform here in this module, but it would be at the end of the module. In the beginning of the module, it's all about generic DevOps. Module two talks about enterprise DevOps. Now this is where we talk about more about Git version control system. Code reviews, okay, and branching flows, etc. So this learning path is more about the development aspect. Learning module three or learning path number three. Now this is actually the biggest one. The one that takes maximum amount of time. It is about implementing CI, which is continuous integration with Azure pipeline. And there is another module which Microsoft has introduced recently, which is GitHub Actions. So you can either develop and build your application either by using Azure pipelines or by using GitHub Actions. So learning module three or learning path three talks about that. And it is one of the biggest and uh, lengthiest, you can say, module in here. It takes more time. Probably, uh, as per my experience, more than one day is required for learning path number three. Moving to learning path number four, design and implementing release strategy. This will actually talk about how do you plan to deploy your application and deliver it to customer. Azure DevOps has two types of pipelines, by the way. One that builds the product and the other one that delivers it. Release pipeline is the actual pipeline or release is basically the concept. In Azure DevOps, which is associated with delivering the product to the end user. And there are a lot many things in here. There are different release strategies. There is a different type of release pipeline with multi stages, etc. So this module or this learning path covers that. Learning path number five is about secure. Uh, uh, continuous deployment. Yeah, secure deployment using Azure pipeline. So this is actually continuation of release strategy. OK, in uh, learning path number five, there are some practical demos and practical hands on labs are included that will allow you to test how you can release your application, deploy it on multiple different platform. Like for example, you can use release pipeline to deploy an application to Azure Pass Service platform like uh, app services. Or you can take your application to Kubernetes cluster, Azure Kubernetes cluster, or you can even handle infrastructure services like virtual machine, for example. Take an application, build it and deliver it to our Azure virtual machine. So those aspects are, you can say, explored in module number five. Learning path number five. Learning path number six now is for operations people. Do you know for operations or system administration, there are two interesting concepts desired state configuration and infrastructure as a code. Now, do you uh, do you know, means anybody here know what is desired state configuration and what is infrastructure as a code? Now this is for operations people, people with system administration experience. Do you know what these two concepts are? And have you used any third party tool 
that offers infrastructure as a code or desired state configuration. Anyone? Yes. Okay, so which tool you are using? Power up. Okay, PowerShell DSC is basically not a third party tool. PowerShell DSC is a tool from Microsoft and uh, you can use it freely with uh, multiple different Microsoft platforms like Azure VM, for example. Yeah, uh, but I was actually expecting something different. Like, I don't know how many of you have uh, used or experienced, uh, have some kind of experience with tools like uh, Ansible, for example or tools like Terraform. Terraform is example of infrastructure as a code. Ansible is more like a PowerShell DSC, but yes, there are some extensions available for Ansible, uh, which can be used to, you know, work as a infrastructure as a code. Means define the infrastructure in a YAML file and deploy it. It is more from Terraform, which is both of these are third party tools. So learning path number six is talking more about infrastructure as a code and these are state configuration and these modules are for operations people. Now it doesn't matter whether you are a developer or you are a system administrator. Knowing about these tools is essential if you want to. Let's say upgrade yourself as DevOps professional. A DevOps professional can originally come from a development background or operations background, but he or she should know all these tools. Now I am saying know all these tools. I do not. I do not mean that they should be expert in these tools. No, that's not needed. So, is it possible that at the time your application is getting deployed, you actually go and set up the environment just before your application is getting deployed, and after your application is undeployed, you go and destroy that entire environment to save the cost. You can do that with the help of infrastructure as a code. Easily, so here in this module we will be discussing some of the infrastructure as a code and DSC uh, like components and uh, there is also an integration available between Azure DevOps and Terraform, Azure DevOps and Ansible. There are actually hands on labs available for this, but this is little advanced module. And that's the reason why most of the other modules like uh, as your pipeline release, etc. will be conducted before this module. Then module seven or learning path seven is about implementing security and validating the code bases for compliance. Now this is where we are slowly moving towards another new trend in DevOps. We call it DevSecOps. Anybody here heard about DevSecOps? Anyone? Yes, DevSecOps basically is DevOps with security involved right from the first initial stage. OK, so this module, this learning path will talk more about how you can integrate security into DevOps. And the first part of implementing security in DevOps is by Scanning your code bases for number of different vulnerabilities or compliances. But please remember, even though it says code bases, it actually covers lot many other aspects also. 
there are also tools available that will scan your code base for all kind of best practices and there are tools available which can even calculate technical depth in your project anybody heard about technical depth anyone technical depth basically means amount of time or amount of efforts required to fix your code now i am not saying your code is bad or your code is wrong your code works fine but there are still some improvements left your code could be better even better it could be optimized further but if you try to optimize it now as per the best practices there will be certain amount of efforts required and you can integrate tools to calculate such thing in azure devops yes sajal you are right uh, you can integrate sonar cube okay or clockworks i'm not sure about clockworks but sonar cube can be integrated easily with easily with azure devops rather azure devops gives you two different options either use sonar cube which is a free open source tool that you can deploy on your on premise machine or cloud vm for free or you can go with sonar cloud which is a saas service software as a service where there is no installation required so that will make sure that whatever application you are building is good and you have taken care of security and the performance both learning module number 8 later will talk about dependency management strategy how do you manage dependencies please remember one thing it might be possible that your developers have taken all the precaution to make sure the code is good one okay there are no technical depth or amount of technical depth is manageable or it's below a threshold yes there are no vulnerabilities in your code but at the same time you also have to check if your project is using any dependency third party dependency a library which is built by somebody else and you will have to ensure that those libraries those dependencies do not have any kind of vulnerabilities in there many a time many a time those dependencies many open source dependencies will have lots of vulnerabilities in them and those vulnerabilities you need to manage them properly how do you manage or what do you mean by managing these vulnerabilities and dependencies a very simple approach is to go and replace those older version of dependencies with new one let me give you an example dependency vulnerabilities example there is a very commonly used java library called log4j wait second okay this is a very commonly used java library used for logging and this library was used by lots of java developers or sometimes you may not be using log4j directly but you are using some java framework like spring hibernate struts or any other which indirectly uses this particular framework can you see the number of vulnerabilities which were there in older version of log4j can you see that now what if you are using this older version of log4j 2.14.1 which has four vulnerabilities in it you can see them all here so dependency management is about this make sure whatever dependencies you have in your project there are no vulnerabilities in them right and there is one more thing also avoid using two old dependencies to give you an example here if you use a very old version of this dependency here there is a chance that this particular framework is not at all compatible with newer version of java java 11 and java 17 because it's a very old one many a time it happens that because you are using a very old particular package or dependency in your project you are not able to build your project correctly because that dependency uses different language runtime or different older version of language runtime and your project is using newer language runtime so you need to have some strategy to manage the 
dependencies. Azure DevOps also have one component called Azure Artifact, which allows you to have your own package repository or package registry. So instead of downloading all the dependencies from internet, you download them from your own Azure DevOps Artifact. Now, by the way, what could be benefit of making all the dependencies download from your own private repository instead of downloading them from internet? What do you think is benefit of doing that? Hello? Yeah. Security. Yes, that's right, Rahul. Many a time it happens that your organization might have some kind of strict network security rules. Your developers might be working on an environment with a proxy or firewall blocking lot many different website and different services. In that case, Having your own dedicated package repository with all the required packages will make sure that your developers won't connect to a random internet website to download any stuff. Number two, you can even have a system which is closed, closed means without any internet access at all. That will improve your security, basically. Also, it will also give your developers few choices. Like, for example, instead of allowing developers to choose any dependency, any version of dependency, you have your own dependencies or your own registry, which will only contain secure and safe dependencies only. If there is any package with vulnerability found, you can remove it from your package repository, which will force developers to use a different version. Are you getting my point? And then module nine, is about continuous feedback, which is actually about monitoring. Why do you need to monitor your application? Or why do you have to constantly take the feedback back to the developers whenever something bad happens? What benefit does it offer? OK. Giving an early feedback or giving proper feedback back to developer whenever something doesn't work or whenever there is a bug found somewhere, right, will actually give them enough time to fix the things. Remember one thing, fixing things. Later in the product lifecycle is more costlier and difficult, but fixing them earlier will actually give your developer enough time to work on it. Yes, for monitoring, yes, for monitoring, you can check the CPU, you can check the RAM, you can check the uh, overall resource utilization over there. I do know an, uh, a scenario where uh, on production server application always used to restart or always used to crash very often, right? And then they shared a feedback to developers saying that, hey, developer, look at this application. The application automatically crashed after half an hour, after half an hour of its deployment. Now, developer will always keep telling you that, no, it's, it should not happen. On my system, I'm able to run it for two hours in a single stretch. There could be a mul multiple different scenarios there. Like if you have a continuous feedback, if you have the monitoring in place, right? Look at the monitoring metrics and check what was happening wrong. It might be possible that after your application was launched, now this is something that happened. There was an application when launched, it started consuming amount of RAM on the given environment. The RAM consumption was going from 30% to 90% in matter of five minutes. And after it crossed 90%, application crashed. And guess what was the reason? The reason was, out of memory error, OOM killed. Application was actually crashed because application was asking for more RAM from the 
underlying infrastructure. And when the request was rejected, application crashed. Right now with this piece of information, you can take multiple. Corrective actions, so what do you think? How should you correct this? Application is shutting down because of out of memory error. How will you fix it? Anybody here? Rahul, Sana, Sajal, Ravindra, anyone? Auto scaling? Yeah, it could be an example. But then if it is auto scaling, then you have to create some kind of auto scaling rule which will monitor for the usage of memory, consumption of memory, and then accordingly scale the new instance. Yes, that's right. Sajal, Nagios, and Prometheus are monitoring tool. They will not help you to fix the issue. They will help you to identify the issue. Getting my point. You can use them in root cause analysis. To fix the issues, there are multiple ways to do that. Look at how much memory your application is consuming initially. You can optimize that, right? You just have to tell your developer, hey developer, why application is using so much of RAM immediately after it is launched? Check what all kind of services you are loading when application is deployed. It might be possible there is an application your developer has created where as soon as application is deployed on server, there is a long process going to happen inside it, which is actually consuming amount of RAM. If possible, developers can optimize the code to make sure that it doesn't use too much of RAM initially when application is deployed. Or whatever data is actually dumped in memory, you should perform a cleanup periodically. Getting my point. Auto scaling is rather an easy option or easier solution, but not a correct solution. I have came across kind of application where people kept scaling the application further up, right? And then they got into a scenario where initially when application is deployed, they need to deploy it with five instances. But after application settle down, you have to scale it down to just two instances. Why? Because now it doesn't need amount of CPU and RAM. It has done the initialization part. Right? Okay, fine. So these are the nine different modules we have in Azure DevOps. And as I told you, many of these modules are very complex and lengthy. Okay? This entire training course will take five days, but here today we will discuss just one and two of them. Any question you have about this learning path, by the way? Anyone? You have any questions about these learning path? We will be discussing module number one, which is DevOps transformation journey, and then we will discuss few things about other modules like uh, pipeline, for example. See, it's not possible to cover all these modules in here, and some of the later modules, like module number five onward, these modules have some kind of dependency on the earlier module. 
So we cannot directly jump on these modules and start discussing this stuff. Are you getting my point? Another interesting thing is uh, Azure DevOps. Microsoft has all these learning path of Azure DevOps available on their Microsoft Learn website. So you should be able to do a self study on your own. OK. Any other question? OK, let's see who all are present here. Uh, Viresh, then Madhur, Anil Kumar, Nataraj. Who all other participants are here? Chinna, Paga, Madhu, Dharam, Veer, Ganesh. Anybody? Any question you have? If you have any question, you can put the question here uh, in a chat window. OK, fine. So this was the course outline basically. About the certification now, if you are preparing for AC 400, then what is the overall weightage for individual modules or individual topics? Now instead of individual topic or module, they have given study areas like for DevOps process and communication, 10 to 15 percent weightage is given source control, which is covered in module number two enterprise DevOps source control is given weightage of 15 to 20 percent. Design implement build and release pipeline, which is actually module three, four, five uh, is given 40 to 45 percent. Security and compliance is given 10 to 15 percent and instrumentation strategy. The monitoring part is given 10 to 15 percent. Now this is just the rough average values you may or may not get exact same amount of weightage in your az 400 exam okay but this is fairly the uh, the the weightage for individual modules and you will notice one thing build and release pipeline has maximum weightage 40 to 45 percent certification exam itself is more than two hours it, it will give you more than two two to three hours to complete the entire examination process and you are expected to get around uh, 32 to 40 questions in this particular exam AZ 400. Okay. There are lots of hands on labs available, but obviously all the hands on labs are optional. That means you will have to choose which lab you will do and which lab you will have to skip. It's because DevOps lab take a lot of time and there are prerequisites as well. Like you need to have an Azure subscription. You need to have Azure DevOps subscription as well. OK, but there are plenty of them. OK. 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 Fine. Yeah. So now about the first module that we will discuss here. What exactly is DevOps and when organization or when your team is moving to DevOps, what precaution you will have to take? So here we'll start. This is learning path number one. Get started with DevOps transformation journey. This particular learning path, as you can see here, this learning path has these many sub modules. And very first sub module here we will be discussing what exactly is a DevOps, OK, and why we should use DevOps. What are the benefits of using DevOps? Then what kind of project we should select for DevOps or DevOps is better for what kind of projects? We will describe the team structure. We will try to understand how many different DevOps tools are present over there, and then we will discuss one of the Azure DevOps tool called 
as your board. Then we will also discuss source control and describe different types of source control and we'll see the source control features available in Azure DevOps. Now. This is the. Learning objectives, we will try to understand Azure repos. We will try to understand source control, etc. So let's start with the DevOps. What basically is a DevOps? Now this is a standard definition of DevOps given by Donovan Brown. In his book, what is DevOps? Now before uh, we proceed, Donovan Brown is more on application uh, server management, infrastructure and operation. So he has given more, uh, you can say, focus on the operations part, but DevOps is for both operation as well as developer. So Donovan's definition of DevOps is DevOps is union of people, process and product to enable continuous delivery of value to the end user. So it is basically a proper collaboration. Between all the people, all the different rules, including operations, testers, developers, etc. Different types of tools like tools which are used for building an application, tools which are run uh, or used for testing the application etc. And products to enable continuous delivery of value to end user. That's the definition from Donovan Brown. Now, what do you mean by continuous and continuous delivery here? Anyone, any guess? Why does it call continuous delivery? Just a guess. Yes, yes, that's right, Rahul. So continuous delivery, the term continuous here refers to the fact that we are not building everything in one single go. What we are actually instead doing, we will build the application in multiple iterations or multiple sprint. What does it mean? We will take first iteration, implement some of the required features, deliver it to customer and expect customer to give you some kind of feedback on it. So if customer wants any kind of improvement, you can start working on it on the next iteration. So you keep building it. Please remember there is one universal truth about software. Softwares are piece of code. Software e is basically a piece of code. Everybody know that, but do you know that there are some end users End user means people who use your software, which is built by your organization. Some of the end users take the literal meaning of software is just a piece of code to a certain level. Like for example, they expect you to add. They expect you to add a new feature into an existing product. Or sometimes they feel that making a small change in application should be easy. I have even seen people who compare software development with editing a Word Excel file. Are you getting my point? Yes. For them, it is like, you know, just open the code, make the changes, save and close. Yeah, I know it's actually true, but there is a lot of amount of time is taken to actually deliver it to customer. We developers, now I'm just assuming here everybody here is developer, but don't worry, we are not writing any code right now. Developers don't just make the change, save the code and close the file. That's not enough. After you save the changes, you need to test and run it. And there are multiple level of testing happens. Do you know that from developer side, a developer is also supposed to write a test case. Do you know what kind of test cases developer is supposed to read and execute, write and execute? Anyone? 
हेलो Do you know a type of test case which is actually written by developers and not by the testers? Unit test. Yes, that's right. That's right, Nisarg. So unit test. So a developer is supposed to write a unit test to validate that yes, whatever I have implemented here, it works. Now after that, you have to also check. whatever code changes developer has made has it introduced any kind of bug or any kind of vulnerability to your project please remember we cannot just keep on adding things as per customer demand we have to verify if that actually somehow contradict some of the other features in your project or provide some kind of bug or introduce some kind of vulnerability in your project it is as like you know customer might have any kind of change requirement like for example one of your end user said i don't like that login process can you just make an application without login log out like i will just type the url and it will just take me in guess what you cannot expect this particular type of requirement you will not accept this requirement because if you do implement it the security of your application is com compromised then are you getting my point do you know that by the way whenever a customer raises a change request or whenever a customer want you to modify certain part of the product which is currently getting built you as a development team has to run a some kind of test on it or you will have to validate validate the customer requirement whether it is doable or not doable and if it is not doable then why it is not doable you have to explain it you have to convince your customer that why implementing this is bad for the software are you getting my point hello hello there would be side effects right so many a time the process is actually very slow customer expect change request should take actually let's say for example you should be able to make the necessary changes and give it back to me in one day that may not be possible you have to check whether it is doable or not if it is not doable and then what are the things that is uh, what are the blockers or what are the uh, you can say choke points here why you cannot implement it if you can implement it then what all kind of requirements are there prerequisites are there right how you can verify that it will not affect performance of your application or security of your application lot many stuff to do the actual implementation itself might take four hours but this pre and post process might take several days right now continuous delivery here means that you do plan all these activities prepare a schedule that in iteration 1 i will be implementing these many features now if customer want to change anything in here you can accommodate that change in the next iteration are you getting my point hello yes so this will actually help you to accommodate the change request and it will actually also help you to tell your customer that these change request actually disturb the flow of execution or implementation for us let's say for example there was a software product which was using this type of adapting change request for the end user and when the software's final release was made it was delayed by full 3 months then end user came back to them and it was like why this project was delayed by 3 months and the team had ready data with them and they were like your representatives in iteration 1 they raised one change request and implementing that change request took 2 days then in iteration 2 there was another change request which took 2 days in iteration 3 there was another change request and customer is like okay okay i understood there were just too many change request there was just too much unplanned work what do we call it hello hello
unplanned work is something that is not only in IT industry, it happens everywhere else. Right? What is disadvantage of this type of unplanned work? Your schedule get delayed. Your product is delayed because of most of the unplanned work. Because initially when you made a schedule, when you said that final software will be delivered in six months, you have actually created a plan. And if you follow the plan, it was possible to deliver it in six months, but you made lots of changes to it. So DevOps actually make sure that you provide that adapted, uh, adaptability to your end user. Don't reject all the change requests straight away. Accept them, accommodate them in the existing building process. That's why it is called continuous delivery of value to the end user. You will notice many a time DevOps is represented by an infinity symbol. You can see the symbol on the right hand side of my screen. So this is a never ending process. It will keep happening forever. So what happens? First you plan. Let's say you are planning your first iteration. You do the plan. What are we going to implement in this iteration? And how big this iteration is? Is it two weeks, three weeks or four weeks? Right? What all features and functionalities we are going to implement now? Then start building, implementing the stuff. Then do the continuous integration. After you build, you do a continuous integration, means build and test it. Then deploy it. Then operate. Then monitor. Get the feedback and include that feedback in your next plan. Are you getting my point? Hello? Are you getting my point? Okay, so this process will keep happening for every next iteration. So every iteration start with plan and every iteration ends with continuous feedback. By the way, is there anybody here who has worked with agile project planning or agile methodology like Scrum, for example? Anyone? Scrum is an example or Scrum is a methodology based on Agile or Scrum is Agile methodology. When software developers and team use Scrum methodology, what they do? In the beginning of every iteration, there is a meeting. And at the end of every iteration also, there is a meeting. And do you know what they discuss in the meeting that is conducted at the end of every iteration or every sprint? Any idea, Ravindra? What do they call it? Meeting that they conduct at the end of every sprint. It's a retrospection meeting. There you will discuss with your team what went right, what went wrong, and where we could have optimized the process or where we could have improvised everything. That is retrospective. How was our last iteration? And do we have any kind of blockers? Do we have any kind of concern that will affect our next schedule? Right? There might be some challenges. There might be something that will affect our schedule or affect our future iterations. If you have any of those blockers, discuss them now at the end of first iteration only. This will give you time or this will give you, you know, uh, the early, early benefit or benefit of making the changes early in the software development lifecycle. Early changes, adapting the changes at early level, right? Like for example, there were application, there was an application which was getting built on .NET Core 3.1. And then one of the team member raised a very valid question. Microsoft has already marked 3.1 as a deprecated version of .NET Core. That means Microsoft is not going to support .NET Core 3.1 hereafter, right? And if you want your product to get all the updates and all the support from the original vendor, what is the latest version of .NET Core that is supported by Microsoft as of now? Anyone, any idea, any .NET developer here? Do you know what is the latest? LTS 
लॉन्ग टर्म सपोर्ट वर्जन ऑफ डॉट नेट कोर डॉट नेट फ्रेमवर्क यूज गूगल सर्च ऑन गूगल सर्च ऑन इंटरनेट your team might make a suggestion like that you will discuss these type of suggestions in retrospective meeting where well, we can improve further and team can take accord, uh, uh, accordingly steps to improve it further to avoid getting the challenges and problems later on right see there are two things you can improve your product number 1 fixing the bugs or avoiding them yes that's right please remember avoiding the bugs or avoiding the difficulties is better than getting the problem getting a bug and trying to fix it fixing a bug is actually too costly requires too much efforts people time and schedule etc tools everything whereas avoiding it is the better plan of action okay fine so this is a continuous process this is called devops you will notice one thing the first part here belongs to developers whereas the second part here belongs to operations people deploying monitoring and operating environment is operations team's responsibility that is devops one interesting part about devops let me tell you one thing whenever you migrate from one kind of product to another product you will have lots of challenges in there rather it is quite observed that organization and team who have adopted agile methodology their initial product or in, in their initial project their initial project were not good or they did not actually get any benefit of devops initially in their first project in their pilot project right it might be difficult to operate at first is that clear it might be difficult to operate at first lot of challenges iterations took too much time right to complete now please remember devops is a continuous learning your first devops project there will be lots of blockage there would be lots of difficulties there would be lots of issues with scheduling the activity work etc but over a period of time you will keep improvising yourself there is a scope of improvement the first deployment that you made or the first let's say 0.1 release of your product might have lots of bugs and your code was not any better but over a period of time by repeating all the processes again and again again and again finally the quality of your product will improve is that clear hello hello is that clear initially you are bound to make mistakes initially the quality may not be at par whenever you use a different kind of a structure and methodology you have to struggle a bit you have to struggle a bit now there is a best practice here now this best practice is not just for devops but you can use it in all the other areas also and the best practice is called ooda observe orient decide and act so observe the current processes orient yourself for the new trend decide what should be done and act please remember decide and act are two different phases they are mentioned here in decide phase you make a final decision that i am going to do this and act is when when you actually go and do this so observe observe how it works orient decide and act o o d a right to give you an example outside software industry let's say you have driven a manual transmission car okay and you have to use the gear lever lot many times while driving and suddenly you got a new um, automatic transmission any kind of automatic transmission car 
and the entire gear lever is gone. Instead of that, you might have a knob or you might have a different type of gear and you don't have to do one, two, three, four, five, right? At first, when you try to drive it, it will be difficult for you. Are you getting my point? You will have lots of anxieties. Like, for example, what will happen if I keep pressing the accelerator too much time? Right? There would be difficulties. You have to observe, observe the entire process, existing processes, orient yourself, decide and act. Use this over there. Okay? Now, in order to improve yourself, you should have or you should actually make data informed decisions. Now, what is data informed decisions or what is data informed? This is actually part of monitoring. Do not make any decision based on impulse. OK, now my previous example is not valid in here. OK, but for actual software development or any product lifecycle, you should have data informed decision. Just because somebody told you, like I told you just a few minutes back, that .NET 6 and .NET 7 is the new .NET Core version supported by Microsoft, that's not enough. Before you take a decision, you should have an information with you. How many software projects are already there using .NET 3.1 and using .NET 5.0 and .NET 6.0? Go to Microsoft website and verify how long Microsoft is planning to give you support for .NET 3.1 and .NET 6.0. This is called data informed decisions. Is that clear? Hello? Have the data ready with you. Don't take impulsive decision. Strive for validated learning. That means if you feel that you have implemented some right practices there, try to get them validated. Now there is one example I can give you here. Under DevOps for developers, there is a concept called code reviews, or we sometimes call it peer reviews. Peer means you are getting your code reviewed by one of your team member only, one of your colleagues only. That's why we call it peer review, reviewed by peers. Or if you want to use a technical term, code review. So you have implemented recently some change. Now what you do, don't directly publish it. Get it reviewed by your team members. Now in DevOps and more specifically, if you use Git version control system, do you know there is a concept in Git called pull request? Anybody heard about pull request? Hello? Anyone? Pull request means you create a formal request and share it with your team members saying that, hey team, I have made recently some changes to my code base. I was trying to implement this new functionality or I was trying to fix this particular bug. I have made some changes. Please review and tell me if I'm doing it right or wrong. Let people discuss it, debate on it, right? And then once everything is okay, once everything is good, you can actually go and publish it. Many of the new scientific theories are first put in some kind of platform where number of scientists will go there and debate on it. First, they do a debate. They release a white paper. Then they have a debate. There are people who are trying to defend it. There are people who are trying to attack it. And after that due process, only it should come to general public. Getting my point? That is called validated learning. Validate your learning. Or else you might feel that you are doing something right, but your team members might have a different point of view on that. So validate it. Shorten your cycle time. What is cycle time? How much time do you take to implement certain functionalities? Like for example, there is a concept that normally we teach in agile methodology. Have you heard about a term called time boxing? Time boxing. You have been assigned a task by your team members or by your team lead and your team lead had a question for you. OK, so tell me we have to do this particular activity. How much time do you think you need to implement this? 
you have to give an estimate. So you said two hours, four hours, one day, two days, something like that. Now, when you are doing it for the first time, your estimates would be wrong initially. It's very difficult to give accurate estimate. Am I right? There is a possibility that you might overestimate the things and there is also a possibility that you might underestimate the things. Now, what is overestimation and what is underestimation? These are very generic terms. So everybody here should know that, right? What do you call overestimate? Anyone? Madhur Goyal, Goyal, sorry. Can you explain me what is overestimate and what is underestimate? You can put it in a chat window. Overestimate means you gave more time, but it actually got covered or implemented in lesser time. You said I will need it, it need four hours and you did it in one hour, then it is overestimate. What is opposite of that? You underestimated the things. Underestimate means you thought it can be done in two hours and it took two days. That is underestimate. Now tell me one thing. When you are new to this type of planning and scheduling, what you will prefer? Overestimation or underestimation? What you would prefer initially? Initially, people prefer overestimation. Why overestimation? It's because initially we are not sure how much time it will take. Right? Time boxing is difficult initially. So it will give you more than enough time. And then you have an option whether to report it or not to report it. It's good if you are able to finish the task before the time. Now, what is expected here? Initially, when you are new to DevOps and Agile uh, project planning, you can do overestimating, but you cannot do it forever. You cannot always go with overestimation. Somewhere down the time, you have to shorten that time. Earlier, you were saying, OK, this task take four hours for me. You cannot always do the task in same amount of time. Maybe somewhere down the time, you will find some kind of shortcut. You will create some kind of reusable script or some type, right? So next time when you are doing the same task, same activity, it should take lesser time than the earlier one. Is that clear? Hello. So shorten your cycle time and optimize validated learning. Validated learning also you need to optimize. You need to find a ways to validate it quickly. Okay, now for that I will give you an example of pull request again sometime later. I hope this point is covered now. What is DevOps? Any questions so far? Okay, I guess there are no questions here. Okay, it's 11.27 now. So I'll just take a very small break here. Just five minutes. Okay, you have any questions? Meanwhile, you can just uh, put it on the chat window and I will answer it.
Okay, I'm back now. Let's continue. Explore the DevOps journey. Now there are, whenever people talk about DevOps, there are these two different workflows, okay, which are very commonly referred as DevOps workflow. The first one is continuous integration workflow and the second one is continuous delivery workflow. Do we have anybody here who has worked with CI CD using maybe another tool like Jenkins, for example? Do we have anybody here who has worked with any CI CD tool? Okay, so Bamboo Server. Azure Pipeline is anyway Azure DevOps tool. Bamboo is another tool from Atlassian for uh, CI CD. And similarly, there is one alternative called Jenkins. So we will talk about the CI and CD both. Don't worry. <laughs> Sorry. So what basically is continuous integration? Continuous integration is about merging the code changes to the application package or if you have assigned a task to one of the developer to implement some certain functionality or to do the bug fix or make any change to software that has to be first reviewed by the people then scan for vulnerability check check the code errors right and after thoroughly verifying everything trying to find the defect code quality issues everything only when it passes through all the parameters only then take it for the next phase, which is continuous delivery. Please remember DevOps is not just equal to automation. Remember the definition of DevOps I discussed with you a few minutes back. It was about providing a value to end user or quality product to end user. And how do we ensure the quality product? By making lots of tests or phases where we will be verifying it for any kind of defect or any kind of uh what we call it either for the uh, defect or for any kind of vulnerabilities is that clear then once continuous integration is over you will then move to continuous delivery in continuous delivery you will take the product which is built by continuous integration the package the artifact you will pick it up and then you will try to deploy it. Now, do you know that some type of test, if you want to run on your product, right? You cannot do it in your continuous integration pipeline. There are certain type of test which requires your application to be fully deployed on a target server, and only then you will be able to run such type of test. Now, do you? Can you give me any example of test? which requires application to be actually up and deployed on some environment. And you cannot do it while compiling the project. Any example, anyone? UAT, feature testing, yes, that's right. Web UI testing, QA. All these type of tests, you cannot integrate them in continuous integration workflow. You can run them, but then you need a proper environment where your application is deployed up and running. And that's why we have a continuous delivery workflow. So what do we take? What do we do in continuous delivery workflow? In continuous delivery workflow, in continuous delivery workflow, what we are actually doing is we take the application built by continuous integration workflow. And. Put it 
on the first environment. Let's say your first environment is a dev environment. Run some test. If it is successful, take it to the next environment, which is let's say a QA environment. Run further few kind of test on it. Then, if successfully tested, take it to the next environment, which which is let's say for UAT test. And once it clears the UAT test, then you can take it to the production environment. Please remember, in production environment, however, we do not run any kind of test. Okay, production environment is the final environment. We don't run any kind of uh, test in production environment. Is that clear? Production environment is the environment where your application will be actually available to all the end users. Any questions, any queries about these two workflows? You can put your queries here on our chat window now. So I guess there, there are no questions this time. Fine. So what are the components now? In order to start your DevOps journey, there are two interesting components you will have to learn first. Number one, you have to first learn about version control system, which is a very necessary tool. And guess what? With or without DevOps, version control system now has become a very standard tool for developers and other IT team members as well. Your organization, your team may or may not be following DevOps, but version control is something they must be using. Now, a very simple question for all of you. How many of you are using version control system like Git, for example? How many of you are using Git version control system? OK, Git as your repos. Yes, that's fine. Bitbucket. Yeah, that's also fine. Bitbucket is just a hosting platform like as your repos or GitHub. Git is a version control system which you use in all these platforms. So uh, nowadays more and more projects are moving towards Git version control system for lots of interesting features that it has to offer. Git is uh, my personal opinion. Git is source code management or source control system. Git is actually designed to be a source code management tool, not just any version control system. Do you know that when it comes to handling binary files or files bigger than 100 MB, big files, Git is actually bad. Git is designed for source code. Source code means you have some .java file, .cs file, .yml file, .xml, something like that. Source code file. You should be able to open that file in any text editor, plain text editor, basically. It's optimized for that. For binary files and large files, no. For large and binary files or binary large file, binary small files, whatever it is, 
other version control system like SVN and TFVC are better, which are centralized by the way. Anyways, Git also has an extension nowadays, means in case if you want to actually store a big file in Git repository, you can do that now with help of an extension called Git large file support, LFS, LFS extension. And if you are using Windows OS with Git, LFS might be already installed or pre-installed in your OS. Okay, and most of the modern operating systems, you will see that Git already has LFS installed in it. Okay. Fine. Fine. The other tool that will actually help you to kickstart your DevOps journey is Agile Project Planning Tool or Lean Project Planning Tool. Agile and Lean. Lean is basically a model based on Agile. Both of them are iterative. Okay. And there are multiple different methodologies like Scrum you can put. So what they do, they allow you to plan and isolate works into iterations or sprint. Manage the team capacity and help your team to quickly adapt changing requirements and changing business need. A DevOps definition of done is a working software collecting telemetry against the intending, intended business goal. So when you say it is done, done means it is already there on end user's machine and it's already capturing and monitoring the transaction and giving you the feedback. Then it's called done. There are a lot many tools available. Now, one very popular tool here is Kanban board. How many of you have seen Kanban board? Heard about it? Fine. Now, Kanban is basically just a pattern, a board pattern. Do you know that it's very easy to actually create a Kanban board on a white uh, on a white board? A physical board, basically. You don't actually need a software. To show you an example, an agile board or a Kanban board drawn physically. I will show you some of the images here. This is how you can even take a simple whiteboard and convert it into a Kanban board. Many of the organizations, many teams actually create this type of board on their local workspace. But this is actually done when all the team sit in the same office, in the same physical space. Then you can take a whiteboard or you can just convert an existing empty wall into a Kanban board. Here you will specify all these are sticky notes, by the way. With the help of sticky notes, they have mentioned what they are currently doing. Kanban, Kanban boards are very flexible. The column headings you need to decide. You can give whatever name you want for those boards. And you can see this is the legion. Like this activity is marketing. This is instrumental. This is events. This is spaces, etc. There is a freedom in Kanban board. You decide what kind of columns you want and how you want to arrange it. So this is the Kanban, for example, an example Kanban, a product backlog, in progress, peer review, in test, done and blocked. Can you see that? Hello? Now the choice is either you can use a physical board with sticky notes, or you can use a software. Now, whenever I talk about a software, there are multiple different software that will actually help you to set up a Kanban board. Now, what are those softwares now? Look at this one, for example. This is some kind of software which is allowing you to set the Kanban board right here. Now, I don't know what kind of software it is. I guess it is Smartsheet. 
I have even seen people using Microsoft Excel sheet for a Kanban. I guess Microsoft Excel now have a template for creating a new Kanban board in your uh, Excel worksheet. OK, these are the examples. Now for the software, you have got software like Azure board. And you have a software like Atlassian and Jira. Let me show you how Azure Board's Kanban dashboard looks alike. This is a Kanban dashboard created by Azure Board, which is part of Azure DevOps. And yes, uh, Anu Prakash, yeah. There is another Kanban board provided by Atlassian Jira. Jira has its own tool to create Kanban board. Let me show you this is how a Kanban board of Atlassian Jira or Jira looks alike. I don't know why it's not opening it. Oh, it's downloading it instead of showing it to us. OK, fine. This is how it looks alike. OK, these are some of the screenshot of. Jira board. Right, and this is not the only tool. There are many other tools which also offers Kanban board. Like for example, there is one called Twilio. Twilio also has an offer or a tool to create your own Kanban board on Twilio. OK, you don't actually need any specific software for it. You can do it very easily using whichever software you might be already using. OK, looks like this. This is an example of Atlassian Jira. You can even see the URL jira.teaminspace.com, a sample project. These are to do's, these are in progress, these are in reviews, and these are done. Can you see that? So you need two things to get started with DevOps a version control system and an agile project planning tool. Then, what are the other requirements? Other requirements now, monitoring and logging. Why do you need monitoring and logging tools? Whenever you get a bug in your product, how will you fix it? But before you fix the bug, you need to provide your developer some important information, right? To allow the, your developer to do the debugging. You cannot debug with no information at all or with no monitoring information at all. Are you getting my point? Let me give you an example. I was doing a consulting work and uh, my client was expecting or my client wanted entire application which was running on premise to be shifted to cloud. Then we were making the plan and then uh, I then then we need to actually make a selection like how much big VM we need on cloud. We wanted to migrate it as a as your VM. So what should be the VM size? How much CPU and RAM it need? They asked me and I was like. Do you have your existing application? Show me your existing application configuration. They showed me that and then I demanded. Then I made a demand. Do you have the monitoring data? For your application running application old monitoring data that will explain me. Out of allocated CPU RAM and other resources, how much resources your application was actually using your application was actually consuming. Do you know why I demanded that uh, that data? It is because most of the time on premise environments are. Over provision. What is over provision? Hello. Anyone what is over provisioning? OK, I will explain over provisioning means. The actual on premise server was allocated, let's say 8 CPUs and 32 GB of RAM. 
but application itself was consuming let's say just 4 gb of ram and 8 cpus okay it might be possible that actual utilization of resources far less than allocated resource and by the way do you know why people actually move to cloud what is number one objective of moving to cloud any hello hello am i audible to all of you cost optimization yeah that's right cost saving now please remember whenever somebody is migrating their applications to cloud their number one objective is to reduce the cost and how you can reduce the cost by making sure that your application you don't actually over provision it on cloud now this might actually seem funny but i'm telling you from my own experience there are people who end up paying more on cloud why because their application services were over provisioned they allocate too many resources but their application is not actually consuming all of that or maybe they over provisioned it because of certain spike in uh, utilization of resource let's say there is an application and the application has kind of a pattern morning 10 to 12 morning 10 to afternoon 12 for two hours, resource utilization of application goes to or resource utilization doubles in that time. And after 12 o'clock, it again goes down. You know what I suggested them? Initialize your application with lesser amount of CPU and memory or overall resources to start your application. Then I told them we will be using some type of auto scaler that will scale your application to double the capacity just at 9.55 a.m. And then at 12.05 p.m., we will scale it down again. Now, what is benefit of the scale up and scale down automatically on time, on schedule? What do you think? It's because it is pay as you go, right? So you have to pay more only for that time when your application was using double amount of resources. So your cost will be double only for those two hours, right? But remaining time, you have to pay only for the amount of resources you have allocated there. That is lesser charges there. Proper resource utilization and cost optimization. This is how you do a cost optimization, basically. See, this type of auto scaling is not possible in on-premise or very difficult to implement in on-premise. But it's very easy to implement such type of thing in cloud. But for that, monitoring data has to be there how did i make this decision i was looking at their applications monitor monitoring dashboard of some sort and i pinpoint or i found it that application was actually using less than 20 percent of resources all the time but only in a particular time duration resource utilization was around 60 or 70 percent so i made a point i made my own notes right and then I told the implementation people because I was architect there. My responsibility is to guide them. People who actually created the resource, did the migration, created the auto scaler, they were implementers basically. I just gave them direction. This is how we can do the optimization. Are you getting my point? I told them what is the right VM size or I told them what is the right app service plan, right? What configuration they should use for this particular application, right? Implementation is done by somebody else. OK, but here you need proper monitoring to be up and there. If you don't have a monitoring tools in place, you won't get that information. You can see on the right hand side here on the screen. This is how monitoring dashboards typically look alike. Now, don't worry. Don't try to read anything here. It's just given as a representation. There are a lot many different monitoring tools out there and their screen will look totally different from each other. Like Nagios is a different monitoring tool and Prometheus is a different monitoring tool. Rather, I have seen people who use Prometheus, they connect Prometheus to yet another tool just for graphical representation or creating this chart and graph. Anybody here used Prometheus with any other presentation tool? And if yes, then what tool do, uh, did you use with Prometheus? 
as a front end. Hello, Grafana. Yes, Grafana is a presentation tool. You can also use uh, tools like uh, I just forgot. There is a tool from Microsoft also. No, Azure Board is not monitoring tool. It's Agile Project Planning tool. Power BI. Datadog is a third party tool. Yes, Datadog is a monitoring tool, Madhur, but it's not from Microsoft. Microsoft has a tool called Power BI, which is basically used for presentation only. OK, it cannot monitor anything on its own. So there are a lot many different tools available with you. Now, whichever tool is already deployed, just go there, get the information and make your informed decision based on that. Then after these three, the fourth one that you need for cloud, uh, sorry, that you need for DevOps is cloud. Why cloud? Because Cloud provides the required agility. You are able to deploy and undeploy your application in matter of minutes. You are able to scale them up and down in matter of minutes. You can even do the horizontal scaling. What is horizontal scaling? Any idea? Yes. OK. Yes, scalability. OK, provisioning new resource or adding new resources, adding new instances. That is horizontal scaling. That's right. That's right. OK, now moving ahead. Next tool. Now this we are going into operations people now or operations uh, kind of role. Now developers may or may not be comfortable with these type of tools, but it is better if you have a quite good idea what these tools are about. Number one, infrastructure as a code. Instead of setting up entire infrastructure manually, what if somehow you can describe your infrastructure in a file and then there is an automation tool that will collect that configuration file and set up the environment based on that. Oh wait, there is a question we have got from Rajesh. Difference between horizontal and vertical scaling. In horizontal scaling, we increase number of instances. Vertical scaling, we just increase amount of resources allocated to the single instance. So let's say you have a virtual machine with four CPU and 16 GB RAM. And if you increase CPU and RAM, let's say from four CPU to eight CPU and from 16 GB to 32 GB. If you are just increasing the amount of resources in given instance, then it is vertical. But if you are adding one more virtual machine, then it is horizontal. OK, so if you scale the resources, it's vertical. If you scale number of instances, then it is horizontal. Is that clear? Yeah. Now back to this module infrastructure as a code. Infrastructure as a code, there are a lot many examples there. How many of you have used ARM templates from Microsoft Azure? ARM templates, a JSON file where you will describe all the Azure resources. You can validate them, the template itself. And then once ready, deploy the template and get all the resources. It's that easy. Do you know almost every cloud nowadays use some other tool for infrastructure as a code implementation? Yes, there is also a third party tool called Terraform. There is also a third party tool called Terraform. Now my experience here, I got this query from uh, one participant and he was like, Mahindra, ARM templates work only for Azure, right? I said, yes, ARM templates are made for Azure resources only, and you can't actually use them for any other cloud uh, resource type. And he was like, their organization is on, in multiple cloud. They use two or three different cloud platform. So what should I do? Means that person, he said, what should he do to make sure that a single document where he will describe resources on cloud A 
resources on cloud B and resources on cloud C. Run it and get the resources created on respective cloud. Is there something to do that? And I said there is already a tool like that. Right? Yes. A third party tool like Terraform can already do that. There is an extension available for Azure. There is extension available for Google Cloud. There is extension available for even Oracle Cloud and IBM Cloud, for example. So infrastructure as a code is becoming very popular in DevOps. This will allow you to set up the environment on the fly. So if you are a DevOps professional, you might expect your operations team to already create a document like ARM template or Terraform state already ready with your application and you just have to go and deploy it so that the entire infrastructure will be ready before your application gets deployed there. One possible scenario, your application need to run in dev, QA and UAT environment. Now, do you think dev, QA and UAT environment should be up and running 24 by 7? Hello? Are you getting my point? To save the cost, what you can do is deploy the dev environment only when application is preparing to go there in dev environment. And after application is done with dev environment and when your application moves from dev environment to QA environment, go and delete the dev environment. Now you can do that with automation, with something like infrastructure as a code. Another challenge, how to make sure that your dev environment, your QA environment, your staging environment, your production environment, all of them are identical to each other. Create a single infrastructure as a code document that will describe the target environment. Now use the same document to create dev, to create QA, to create production, and to create UAT environment, all the environment. You know what is benefit here? Let's say you made some changes to the infrastructure. Like for example, like for example, it, it's very common by the way. Earlier, you were having an application deployed in app service and database running on a VM. Now you made a different decision. We will not run database inside a VM. We will instead use PaaS service, database as a service, DB as a service, like Azure SQL database, for example. In that case, just modify your infrastructure as a code document that will deploy those resources and apply it in all four environments. Is that clear? Hello? Are you getting my point? One experience that I had, there was a Python based application where dev environment was using Python 2.7 and next environment was using Python 3.5. Okay. And unfortunately, Python 3 is not backward compatible with Python 2.7. So application used to work fine on dev environment, but on next QA environment, it used to give lots of errors. This happened because all the four environments were separately maintained. You might make necessary changes to dev environment, but the changes were not replicated in the next environment. So there is a kind of inconsistent environments over there. You can avoid that if you use infrastructure as a code. Set up those environments from a code, which you can edit, modify if required. And the same changes will be applied to all the four stages. I hope you got my point. Any question on this? I'll give you one minute to post any questions if you have.
Okay. Uh, unfortunately, Rajesh, you cannot convert ARM template to Terraform. There is no such tool available. But there is one thing you can do. You can use some plugins, Terraform plugins, to deploy ARM template via Terraform file, state file. Okay. So you don't have to convert anything. As far as I know, there are no such tools available that will do the conversion. It's possible, by the way, some open source developer might actually take up the challenge and build it. But the real challenge would be as your ARM templates are based on management API, REST API, Microsoft keep updating every now and then. Even for creating something as basic as network interface card using ARM template, as of now, there are minimum four to five different API versions available. Okay, like 2019-03, 2019-09, something like that. Multiple version of the same API. And accommodating all of them in your tool is a lot of work. Okay, so that's the difficulty. It's not like it's not doable, but I don't see there is any kind of tool who is doing it right now. Okay, yeah, one more point left, microservices. Now, this is something which is becoming very common now. What is microservice? Microservices is a new architectural pattern. Instead of building your entire application as one huge monolith component, we split it into multiple independent microservices. Where each one of these microservices is independent from others and can be scaled, updated, or upgraded independent of other components. So if let's say one of your microservices has some bug, what you can do? Just go and fix it. And while we do that, roll back that particular instance to its older version, which had no bug, and allow that older no bug version to communicate with rest of the application. Are you getting my point? It's very commonly done, or it's very common, fairly common scenario. You try to introduce a new feature into one of the microservices, and then you realize implementing a new feature has introduced a bug. How to fix the bug now? You cannot continue that application to run because that bug will be exploited a lot more time then. So what you do, just roll back that particular microservice, only that service back to its older version where the feature was missing or was not developed that time. Allow application and users to use the older version. You can just give them a kind of notification somewhere that we are working on a bug on this particular module. So the new feature will not be available for some time now. It's better, right? Hello? Instead of taking down entire application because there is a bug in one microservice, it's better to just take that particular microservice down and replace it with old version. The only loss end users will have is the new feature which got introduced last week is in inaccessible to them now. Is that clear? Hello? And guess what? Many of your end users might not even be interested in that new feature. So they won't find any difference. Is that clear? Okay, I guess no questions. Fine. 
So microservices architecture is something that you should learn. Now again, it's optional. Please remember whenever we are talking about these tools, the first two tools are mandatory. And you should anyway know them with or without DevOps. Then these becomes optional, but recommended. And this is something further, you can say you can say lower priority. Microservices is a desired architectural pattern, but let me tell you one thing. You don't have to actually build everything as microservice. Do you know what are challenges if you build your application as a microservice? What is a challenging aspect of microservice? Any advantage I can I can say a disadvantage of microservice. OK, fine, I will explain. One of the challenges of microservices is now instead of managing just one huge monolith application, you have to manage multiple tiny applications. Now, please remember, just because we call them microservice, that doesn't actually necessarily mean that they need to be tiny. What does it mean that every single application will take care of one particular type of features, like one for billing, one for uh, product search or product catalog, one for ordering, etc. Right. So you instead of managing one single application, now you have to suddenly manage multiple application servers or multiple applications and manually handling them becomes a difficult task. If you are going for microservices pattern, then use of automation tool is recommended. You should use some kind of automation maybe use infrastructure as a code to define the target environment for all your 10 15 microservices at once is that clear okay so there is an extra challenge which you can solve with automation. Now, number now the next one. How many of you have heard about containerization, by the way? Anybody here? Docker container. Yes, that's right. A small spelling mistake, however. Docker, D-O-C-K-E-R. Docker is actually a container platform. There are alternatives also, but Docker is the most popular one. I'll explain you why uh, Docker is more popular. What are containers? Containers are, you know, you can say the uh, next technology after virtualization. A very common problem that we as a developer, operations, or even any, any role in uh, software industry, software industry as a whole, we were having a very typical problem when 
an application doesn't work in the production environment but works fine in developers machine and then every time you go back to developers and say that this doesn't work they will come back with an counter argument saying that but it works on my machine how many of you have heard this but it worked on my machine an excuse from the development team yes it's very common and then you know what is a typical reply from the uh, from the operations team the application was not at all developed for you being an end user you are the developer right so on whose machine it should run on the end users machine you are not the end user right it doesn't matter whether it works on your machine or it crashes on your machine as far as operations team system administration team or management is concerned your application should work better on end user system are you getting my point do you know that there are lot of open source software out there if you run them in a developer mode it will give you lots of errors but on end user machines they work just fine next time when you open any website do you know there is something called uh, a developer console in every browser web browser have you seen that just visit any website and press control shift i on your keyboard and you will get a developer console you will be surprised to know that almost every website you visit developer console will give you lots of lots of error messages there there are only few website where you won't get any error at all right but there are lots of website if you open developer console you will see number of red lines the thing is end user should not get any difficulty while using the software now it's only because you are using developer console end user won't even see it anywhere anyways what should we do shall we just take the developer machine and put it on the production machine yes it can be done use virtualization instead of running your application directly put that application inside a vm run it in dev machine does it work yes then take the entire virtual machine and put it on the end user machine now if it works on dev it should work in production as well because you are not just taking that single application you are taking the entire vm along with that application and putting it on the target machine is that clear everyone hello but there is a challenging aspect here taking the entire virtual machine there are lots of challenges virtual machines are heavier they require more resources because every virtual machine has a full fledged guest operating system or operating system inside it which requires certain amount of cpu and ram for itself for its own okay fine so containers provide the next solution how about it is something in between app and vm like a virtual machine you will include application and all its dependencies inside a container so it will have language runtime third party dependencies required configuration everything in one single unit but what it does not have is the full fledged os instead of full fledged os it will just have several os libraries that will allow it to communicate with the host machine directly okay host operating system directly so containers compared to virtual machines are extremely lightweight but remember there is a simple rule one container should contain only one application whereas a virtual machine can contain multiple application inside it a container should be the ratio should be 1 to 1 one container for one app and if you have two or three apps each application should go in its own container is that clear if you have multiple apps each one of them will have a dedicated container for itself so if you are building a microservice 
every single microservice will be translated into a container or you will create a container for them. Any question about this containers? Anyone? So containers, sorry. Yeah, containers are the next in evolution. You can package your application as container images and publish them or push them to a remote registry. Okay, on that remote registry, on that remote registry, you can then keep them with a proper security, authentication, authorization, everything in place. Once it's all done, OK, you can design an application or you can have a DevOps pipeline to download those images from the secure location and put them on the production machine or put them somewhere on, let's say, the cloud cluster, for example, Kubernetes cluster on cloud, for example. You can use it that way. Is that clear? So we have discussed some of the DevOps tool that you should learn if you want to completely migrate or completely become a DevOps professional. Any question you have about any of these tools, by the way? OK, then now agile development process. Now, before we start discussing agile development process, let us compare older. Development approach called waterfall waterfall approach with the newer agile approach. Waterfall is actually a de facto, uh, de facto a standard approach used for many years. What exactly do, do you do in waterfall approach? In waterfall approach, we have these typical phases. Define, analyze, build, test, and finally deliver. But you know what is interesting thing here? You cannot go back. Waterfall approach is a linear approach. First, you have to define the entire architecture, analyze it, build it, then test it, and then deliver it. It's very difficult to go back to a previous state and start all over again. In waterfall approach, before you move to the next phase, you have to ensure that your current phase is completed and there are no modifications required. So as soon as you move from define to analyze, that means there is nothing else to define now. 
you cannot go back and make some changes there. After you move from analyze to build, you cannot go back to analyze. It's a linear. And even if you try to do that, go back to a previous step, previous stage to make some changes, it's going to take a lot of efforts and cost. And of course, your scheduling has to be redone. The waterfall approach has this basic limitation. Hard to accurately define the requirements. Please remember, customer requirements can change. Or rather, lot of people cannot even express what they want from the software. Are you getting my point? Hello? Many a times, end user may not be able to describe correctly what he or she wants. Define the requirements is difficult. Many a time, there might be some changes suggested over a time. Like we don't want it like this. We want it like this. Requirements might change. Many a time, there are some technical jargons that belongs to a particular domain. Like for example, you are a software developer. And when customer tell you that we have to calculate an interest on amount, you might take, for example, a simple interest. But then customer might correct you later on saying that, no, this formula is wrong. We don't use this formula. We instead use compound interest formula. And this is the formula that we use, which might be different than your formula. That's possible. I'm just giving you an example. Did you get my point? OK, then next agile approach. So waterfall approach should be used when requirements can be frozen, accurately defined and which never changes over the time. But for all other type of project, you should go with agile approach where we actually allow constant changes. Allow changes or allow change request over a period of time. How it is possible then? It's because we don't do everything at once. Define, analyze, build, test and deliver. No, we instead split it into multiple iterations. In iteration one, we will define the requirement for iteration one. We will analyze them, build, test and deliver only iteration one. Selected few features only we will be deploying there. And then we will do the check. We will get the feedback. And based on that feedback, we will decide what we are going to do next. Are we going to develop new features, new set of features, or we are going to develop new feature plus improvise something that we have built in earlier iteration or earlier sprint. So it will keep on happening. Do you know what is a normal duration for a sprint? A common duration, an average duration of a single sprint? Anyone? Yes, typically it will go for few weeks. Maximum it would be four weeks. Four weeks is very rare, by the way. Typically people use a minimum two to three weeks for a single sprint. 
four is the maximum one. It should not be beyond four. It should not be more than one month. Okay, fine. Let's continue next. So agile approach, we use uh, multiple releases, multiple iterations. And typically I'll tell you what, you don't actually have to do a deployment at the end of every iteration. Rather, what many organizations and team do, they group multiple iterations into one milestone. Okay, let's say for example, we will be delivering application version 0.1 to our end user at the end of let's say third iteration then at the end of fifth iteration we will do second release or second milestone right so many times we have this type of setup okay we will have a different uh, kind of release cycle based on number of iterations group of iterations at the end of every iteration, you should have tested working code, but that does not necessarily mean you have to deliver it to customer. You can deliver it after every milestone achieved. It is focused on short term outcomes, not the long term outcome, whereas waterfall approach always goes for long term. Long term uh, outcome, whereas here we will be talking about the short terms. Okay. Next. There are some principles. There are total 12 principles of agile development. So if you are following agile methodology, these are the 12 points you should take care of. Number one, satisfy customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. Your customer do not have to wait for entire software to be ready in, let's say, six months or one year. Instead of that, do a partial delivery. Let's say we started working on a project and next month we will be releasing version 0.1 with selected few functionalities already implemented. Right, so that customer can start using it and give you the valuable feedback. Use the feedback changing requirement to improve your product further. Deliver the working software frequently, so don't deliver everything at once. Deliver it in, you can say, iterations. Is that clear? Like when you go to a restaurant, there are restaurants where your waiter might use a, or adapt a strategy like this. Let's say if you take an entire family for a dinner, right? They might first, you know, order, let's say the starters. Then after some time, the main main course. And then after that, the, uh, the, the final one, what we call it. I just forgot the name, right? Deserts. Like that. So instead of taking everything to your table at once, it's better to do it one by one. Do you know many restaurants nowadays, they don't have enough space on the table for four, five or more people. So if you put everything at once, there won't be any space left. So what they do, they do it like in iterations. First, give the starters, collect the empty plates and then go for the next item like that. This is iterative model which you should use in software development as well. I hope the point is clear now. I will give you a link. This is a link uh, from Agile Alliance. These are the rules or you can say best practices created or designed by Agile Alliance. Let me take you to the URL. I don't know why it's not opening here. Uh, 
Okay, I will just copy the link and put it here in a chat window so you will be able to explore it on your own. This is the Agile Manifesto, which includes total 12 steps. Changing requirement, welcome changing requirement. Number three is deliver working software frequently. At same as first and second point, work together throughout the project. So you should not have separate dev team and separate ops team working independently. Rather, both all the teams should work together to be able to achieve the common objective. Build projects around motivated individuals, have face to face communication between the team members, measure your progress through working software. How many of your deployments or releases were successful? How many of your releases failed? That should be the metrics to measure whether you are doing a good job. Agile process to pro promote the sustainable development. Continuous attention to technical excellence. You can do that by using multiple tests and verifications. Simplicity, art of minimizing the amount of work not done. OK, so simplicity is one aspect here. Don't have you don't have to actually overly complicate the stuff. I can give you an example here. There are people who claim that they can build. Entire .NET application or entire Java application only with notepad and a command line. Say no to such people. You know why? IDEs like Eclipse, NetBeans, Visual Studio, they provide productivity tools so that your developer will spend more time in writing meaningful code and less time in struggling with CLI environment. Am I right? That is called simplicity. No need to overly complicate these things. Your self-organizing team, your team should be able to organize on their own. Right? So people who are motivated, people who know the technology and they know how to take up a challenge. Self-organizing team. Reflect on how to become more effective. Every iteration, you will have an introspection meeting where you will try to speak, try to understand in next iteration what we should do to improve ourselves further. Okay. Can you just visit the link and go through all these 12 points there? I'll give you two minutes to try that.
Okay, I hope you have explored all these 12 principles. You have any questions, queries about them? You can put the question here in the chat. Okay, then let's proceed. Uh, there are a few points we'll discuss and then we'll take a lunch break. Okay, so identify transformation team. If your people are moving for DevOps or if your organization is moving to migrate to DevOps uh, practices, you will have to identify a proper team who's ready to move to, uh, to DevOps or ready to move to a new technology. Now, what are the challenges here? The first challenge would be availability of staff. How this could be a challenge? Anyone? How do you think it's a challenge? Remember, every one of us has some kind of schedule already created, some of some type of task with deadlines attached to them. Am I right? How many of you are still thinking about your coming upcoming deadlines? like what we have to complete by, let's say, Monday or Tuesday or maybe today evening. We have several deadlines for several tasks assigned to us. Availability of staff would be an issue if you are asking people, OK, how many of you are ready to move to DevOps and ready to learn DevOps this week? They might have their own challenges. They might have their own uh, deadlines, their own pending tasks and everything. And because of that, they may not be available. Availability of staff could be a challenge. Disruption of current procedures and processes. If you ask your team to do a knowledge sharing session, KT session, or to learn about a new team, they have to be given some time to do that upgrade, which might disrupt their current processes and procedures. So what you should do, identify a team which have enough time or adjust the time work allocated. Also, you have to 
make sure the team is focused on the transformation people themselves should you know take up this as a challenge yes i will try to learn go and learn devops you cannot force somebody to go and learn a new technology because that way they don't have enough motivation to actually try that okay so identify a team who's motivated enough to do the migration people who are uh, respected in their subject areas if they are developers a well respected developers with an experience if they are operations people they should be a subject matter expert in their individual field your team could be internal or your team could be external to give you an example uh, first time when any organization follows devops or agile methodology let's say scrum you know many organizations what they do they go for an external agile coach agile coach could be an external person one who will actually guide your team on how to adapt agile methodology how to adapt scrum methodology okay so you might have a kind of a person who is external to your business but still part of that migration journey this can be done if you don't have availability of staff or you feel like there is no expert person you have subject matter expert within your internal team then shared goals and defined timelines there should be some achievable goals you should decide like for example now these are some sample uh, goals an organization decided they will be migrating to devops but they have a clear goal let's say they want to reduce the time spent on fixing bug by 60% currently we are let's say spending too much time on bugs bug fixing can we reduce that reduce the time spent on unplanned work by 70% too much of unplanned work my team is doing every day team is working let's say 80% unplanned activities and only 20% planned activities this will actually you know create a very bitter very bad situation so people do allow uh, adapt agile methodologies logics to reduce the unplanned work so you should have a clear goal how much unplanned work you want to reduce reduce out of hours work required by the staff what is out of hours work see whenever there is a lot of unplanned work which means people have to adjust their working hour somewhere are you getting my point you have to finish the planned activities and you have to complete the unplanned activities as well which will result in out of hours work people have to work outside their regular working hours okay remove all direct patching of production system there should be no patching directly on production now this is funny thing every organization dream about it that we should not allow any kind of direct patching on production system whenever you want to do a patch don't do it in production machine build a bug fix get it run tested validated by everyone and then deploy the tested version to production but then it has to go through all the phases dev qa uat and then production but you know what people still do it any benefit of direct patching by the way anybody here what do you think is benefit of direct patching on production system hello hello am i audible yes vivek what is benefit of direct patching of application on production system no that's a disadvantage risk of server going down is a disadvantage if you try to patch anything on production i am asking you about what is an advantage okay let me give you an example there was a developer and uh, application was written in java language okay and developer has written somewhere inside application a code to read 
a configuration file. And the code mentioned there was like this C colon slash some folder name slash some file name. And whenever that application was deployed on a Linux server, it used to crash because obviously Linux don't have C drive and D drive. Now, how to fix this? Easy way to fix this might be first make the changes and deploy the changed application directly in production because I already know what we need to change. So what one of the developer did, modified the code, changed the path from C colon slash to just one single forward slash. That means root directory, no C drive anymore. Save the application, build a new jar file and gave it to production system to run. This is called direct patching. Or maybe in some cases, you just RDP or SSH into production machine, make the configuration changes, apply, restart your application and it's done. There is a risk of server going down. There is also a risk of vulnerability. You opened an RDP port on production server, make some changes, closed it, but you did not close the RDP port. Your RDP port is still open. Attackers, hackers might misuse it. Are you getting my point? But what is benefit? Direct patching, you will save the time. Your application is already down. People are shouting, it's down. Please do something. Now, if you use the standard approach, it is going to take time. So what people do use? Use a shortcut. Directly patch the production machine. Your server is up now. Right? So there is an advantage and there is a disadvantage. And many organizations, at least on paper, they say, we will avoid this. But guess what? If you don't use this, you have to go through the process. Now there is another solution. Automate everything. Every time there is a bug, let your developer fix it and it will immediately go to continuous integration pipeline, build it, continuous delivery pipeline, deploy it. There might be a gap of let's say 5 to 10 minutes or 15, 20 minutes, but that's it. You have the application properly patched. Is that clear, everyone? Hello? Okay, so we have discussed a lot of points so far and it's almost one o'clock now, so I guess we should take a break here. Okay. So we'll take a break now and uh, we will continue at around 1.45. Is that clear, everyone?
Hello everyone. Uh, I am sharing with you the learning achievement batch tips in the chat box. As we are on a break, I hope uh, everyone can redeem this. And also, once you uh, activate the batch, now uh, please do share the screenshot of it. And also, I'm dropping the details regarding our upcoming webinars. Uh, so, if anyone is interested in that, then please uh, register for those webinars also. Thank you.
Hello, um, hello everyone. I have shared the learning achievement batch steps in the chat box. So please uh, do redeem it or do activate it. And if you have any uh, difficulties while redeeming it, please you can write it on chat box. And I'm also sharing the feedback form in the chat box. Do share your valuable feedback in that form. Thank you.
Okay, I'm back now. Hello. Am I audible to all of you? Okay, then I guess we should get started now. Okay. I hope everyone is back. Uh, break, let's break. I'll start sharing my screen. Let's see. Okay. I hope my screen is visible to all of you right now. Can you please confirm? Hello. Hello, is my screen visible to everyone? OK, thank you. So. These were the goals that we discussed. So before going on break, before lunch break, we discussed what exactly is DevOps and uh, what an organization can do to migrate towards DevOps. And this was the last slide where we were discussing the uh, basic goals that you might have for the DevOps. Just give me a minute. OK, then. Other than. Yeah. Shared goals and responsibilities. That is what we were talking about. Then next thing, explore the goals. You should also set your timelines to be achievable. So whenever you are migrating from one product to another product or one technology to another product, never make unachievable goals. Your goals should be relatively achievable. 